That ought to wake us up, huh? Thank you, Mehdi. That was beautiful. So this is a day, uh, I guess it's okay to preach, but really I want you to think of it more as a Bible study, okay? We're going to focus on a passage in the uh, letter to the Romans that until I looked at it more closely a couple years ago, I didn't realize what was there. And uh, hopefully we can learn together. But I want to start out with uh, the verse in Isaiah, Isaiah 40, 28. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. Most scholars agree that the book of Isaiah is actually two parts. In fact, they actually call it Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2. And the first part goes from chapters 1 through 39. And overall, it's kind of a focus on what's wrong with the human race and what's wrong specifically with God's people and how they need to change, what they need to do better. It's focused on their failings and their actions. But in chapter 40, there's this shift in the tone and the direction and the message of, of Isaiah. And the shift is away from human beings and to God. And so Isaiah 40 really focuses on a, a comparison between all the false gods of this earth and the idols that were so prevalent in Isaiah's day and uh, uh, the creator God, Yahweh as he was known. And the word Yahweh just means I am that I am. Remember Moses asked God, who am I going to tell Pharaoh that you are? He says, just tell him I am that I am. It's not some, some flowery name. It's just like existence. It's just life. <laughs> uh, and he says, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. When I was uh, a teenager in high school, one of the, one of the things that really uh, made a, a deep impression in my mind and, and helped shape my thinking, and I guess you could say my theology, was a book by a guy named J.B. Phillips. If you're my age, you might be familiar with the Phillips uh, paraphrase of the Bible, J.B. Phillips. And uh, it's a great, uh, a great paraphrase. You can learn a lot, get a lot of insight into the way that he, that he interprets uh, uh, the New Testament. But the name of the book was Your God is Too Small. I think you might even be able to get it free on the internet somewhere. Your God is too small. And for the first time in my life, it challenged me with the reality that I, I had never thought of. I thought of God as church, and I thought of God as religion, and I thought of God as Bible study and going to church school and so forth. But he talked about uh, more than a dozen false views of God. One of them was the celestial cop. God's always watching out to make sure that people don't do the, or his creation doesn't do the wrong things, and people specifically. Or God is an old man who sits on a throne and just kind of waits and watches, and he manages uh, in, a, in a removed way, he's a removed director. Or he's the mild Jesus who never does anything to hurt anybody and only speaks peace and love and happiness. <laughs> And if you've read the Gospels, you know that Jesus is so much more than that. So much more than that. These and more limit God to what we can conceive. Someone has suggested that in modern times, human beings, all of us in our culture, have rewritten the verses in Genesis to read, man created God in his own image. But the truth is, God cannot be limited to our conceptions or our lack of uh, conceptions by our definitions, by our prohibitions. God doesn't belong to just one nation or denomination. He's not Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, Muslim, Jew, Hindu, or Adventist. He's God, right? The God revealed in Scripture is the creator. You can't put him in a box. You can't restrict him to a particular religion or way of thinking or color of skin. We cannot define or categorize, contain or theologize God. He lives above and beyond us. 
And that's exactly what draws us to God. Because this great God is the same one who made us desire his transcendence. We have a craving uh, to be part of something and someone greater than ourselves. I don't know if you've ever felt that, but I certainly have. It's one of the reasons why uh, I belong to a, a, a community of faith. Why I preach some of the time nowadays, most of the time I'm sitting in a booth trying to manage the audio for our live stream at Vallejo Drive Church. But it's one of the reasons why I try to become involved in things that aren't just about me and things that I'm, I alone can accomplish. It's in our DNA to seek the divine. It's in our DNA to know meaning and purpose beyond what we see and feel and think. Our great God is not God in the box, not a pocket God that we can take out and control like we do our smartphones. Brought mine up here with me. And you have yours with you too, as I'm sure. In fact, uh, I used to have people ask me, where's your Bible? How come you don't preach out of the Bible? I say, say I do. It's right here. <laughs> in many, many different translations. Um, and he's not a relic God that we find in an antique store, put up on a shelf and show to our friends and say, isn't that a nice God? The God we worship is indeed great and grand and magnificent, transcendent, immense, eternal, immortal, there's probably lots and lots uh, more words that we could use to describe God, and none of them would adequately give us an understanding of God in his completeness. Paul talks about this in Romans 11, where he tries to explain the unexplainable. Romans 11 is an interesting chapter because it it's, uh, uh, kind of brings the discussion that Paul has in the book of Romans that basically is, is a writing, a letter about the grace of God and the plan of salvation and the covenant uh, promises of God to Abraham and to all of his descendants, whether they are blood descendants or belief descendants. And he goes into this discussion about the Gentiles and the Jews. And of course, the Jews in, in Paul's day believed that they were the specially favored people of God, that they were the only ones but when Jesus came, he kind of broke, broke that down. In fact, Paul says in Ephesians that he broke down the dividing wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. And, and, he, and he posits in chapter 11 that this is one of the greatest things that God is going to do is to bring a reconciliation between those who are in and those who are out. To bring the understanding of Jesus Christ and the gospel to every creature under heaven. And uh, I just wonder what our world would be like today if the Israelis and the Palestinians just caught a glimpse of the true God who cares and has created every single human being on the face of the earth. And that instead of looking at our differences, and looking at the ways, that, the things that we disagree about, and looking at the pain and the suffering that we've endured over the years from each side, we look to God and realize that He is the answer. He is the solution to all that we have. And I believe that's why God has put the church on this earth, so that we can be the conduit of that kind of grace and goodness to the world. So, as a conclusion to chapter 11, as he's discussing this, and you can read it this afternoon or later, uh, he, he just breaks out into this doxology. Doxology. Most of us, when we hear the word doxology, we think of praise God from whom all blessings flow. You can sing it with me. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. How many times did I hear that growing up in church? We didn't need words to sing it, right? Because we know it so well. 
And I think sometimes we, we believe or we have the idea that that was just kind of somebody, uh, some music scholar sat down and penned the words and then wrote the notes on a page. And we, we kind of sing it that way. Praise God. From <laughs> That's not the kind of doxology that uh, Paul is, is breaking out to in his writing. A doxology, in, in your notes, it says a doxology is literally a glory word, a word or saying attributing glory to someone or something, usually spontaneous and impulsive. And in our context, a doxology is a spontaneous attributing of glory to God for something glorious he's done. That's what Paul is doing. It's spontaneous. It's spontaneous. So that's what we want to look at today, is this doxology. First of all, three things we're going to focus on, and then one truth about God. First of all, God's generosity and wisdom. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for advancing. God's generosity and wisdom are unbelievable are unbelievable. Have you ever come on anything quite like this? Quite like this extravagant generosity of God, this deep, deep wisdom. It's way over our heads. We'll never figure it out. That's from the message uh, paraphrase in Romans 11.33. He says, have you ever come across anything like this extravagant generosity? The word for generosity is a Greek word that really means riches. The riches that God has poured out on us. The extravagant riches. I preached a couple of weeks ago about the riches of God's grace. And what a windfall we have and we don't even know it. We don't realize what we possess that God has given to us. He says, have you ever come across anything like this Deep, deep wisdom and knowledge. It's way over our heads. We'll never figure it out. Religion is the way that human beings show up to God. It's the way that we try to understand God. But God shows up to us through revelation. Through revelation. Through what he reveals about himself. We know him and know him only by what he chooses to reveal to us. And there's so much more than what he has revealed to us. In fact, sometimes I think he, he hides himself a little bit just so that we'll seek him out. We'll try to learn. We'll try to understand. From Paul's uh, perspective, who would have ever thought that there could, in his day, who would have ever thought that there could ever be a reconciliation of Jews and Gentiles? It was such a, a hard rule that you don't mingle with those people, you don't, you don't uh, let them into your community, you don't eat with them, you can do business with them if you have some intermediaries or whatever the rules they might have had, have had in the day. The people of God were descended from Abraham. Their specially favored status was a birthright. Like uh, once a Hebrew, always a Hebrew. Growing up, I always heard that, not about Hebrews, but about Adventists. Once an Adventist, always an Adventist. In fact, I remember being told, you know, if somebody ever leaves the Adventist church, they'll never be anything else. Well, I'm old enough to tell you I have enough friends that have become something else, <laughs> for sure. But it's kind of that mindset, you know. And God, in his wisdom, has determined that anyone connected to Jesus Christ would be part of his family, and his family still includes his favorite children. Are we, as Adventists, part of God's family? Amen. Yes, we are. Does God have any other children? Yes, he does. And he wants to bring us together because the truth, the way, and the life is not somebody's way here or somebody's way there. It's Jesus Christ who is the truth, the way, and the life. This part of the verse talks about the extravagant generosity of God, this deep, deep wisdom. I thought about how extravagant, extravagantly generous God has been with me over my lifetime. 
He gave me a life, a family, and children so I could understand a little bit of his role as a parent. He endowed me with certain abilities so I could get a glimpse of his creative core. I started out as an art major. I think I got scared of art and went to religion instead, but I still have that deep in my soul. And uh, I have a, a, a sensitivity to things that are visual and to music. I was talking with a friend up in uh, Berkeley last night. Uh, my best friend, Ron, is a pastor at Berkeley, uh, Life Church of Berkeley. And his wife is, a, is just a, an incredible artistic person. And she stages homes in the Bay Area and so forth. And she recently has decided to, to start painting. And so she's painting all these paintings. They're very, uh, very abstract and very modern, but they fit perfectly in the spaces that she's staging. And she shared some of the pictures with me. And it's like, that's fantastic, Carolyn. How come you haven't been doing that for the last 20 or 30 years? <laughs> I am so, so thankful that he uh, has given me a most beautiful and loving companion, my wife, Diana so I could understand something of love. But most of all, he gave me Jesus Christ, the gift of eternal belonging in life. And, and, and what God gives to us is deep, deep wisdom. I wouldn't have done that for myself. If I had been not myself and looking at me, I would have said, mm, I don't know. He could do a few things. I'm not sure about his potential. <laughs> and he's not always focused, not always faithful, too sinful. But God in his great wisdom said for me and for you and for every person, I'll make him or her my child. I'll make him or her a younger brother or sister to Jesus. I don't understand it. I can't wrap my mind around it. It's absolutely unbelievable. Some of you might have heard about the unbelievable series that uh, took place a couple of months ago in, at Loma Linda University Church. And I, I would encourage you, it's like a week-long series that a, three different pastors put on together. They weren't from Loma Linda. But it, it, it really encapsulates the gospel message in a fresh Adventist context. And if you get a chance, you don't, you know, you have uh, some time on a rainy Advent, uh, a rainy Sabbath afternoon, uh, look it up on YouTube. I, I believe you'll really be refreshed and challenged by what it shares. It's called Unbelievable at uh, LLUC.org, and they didn't pay me to give that advertisement. I just loved it so much, I thought I'd share it. Kind of like the gospel, right? We love it so much that uh, we're willing to share it. God's generosity and wisdom are unbelievable, and God's decisions and ways are unfathomable. God's decisions and ways are unfathomable. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. Wow, isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? His decisions and his ways. Do you ever wonder why God made, made dogs bark? Have you ever been annoyed by a barking dog in the middle of the night? Or a barking dog in your house? <laughs> or a dog who barks, but it sounds like he's talking. My wife loves to, uh, first thing in the morning, we usually wake up pretty early, you know, around four o'clock. And once she reads her Bible reading, she starts looking at animal videos on YouTube. <laughs> I'm trying to read my devotional and she's over there looking at it and she keeps saying, look, look, look. And then these dogs will start singing and barking and talking, especially the Frenchies, the French bulldogs. Why did God make dogs to bark? Why, why are they like they are? Or birds to sing. When Diane and I were first married, our daughter gave us a bird. She worked at a, she worked at a daycare center and someone, some parent had brought a bird and she said, I can't take care of this and take care of kids too. So here, guess what? I get, here's a gift for you. We didn't ask for a bird. 
little white bird. We called called uh, called him a unique name, Birdie. And uh, as I watched him from day to day and interacted with him from day to day, I was absolutely amazed at the personality that was instilled in that little tiny head. The way that he he would sometimes open his cage and fly out, fly around, and then come and land on the breakfast table and look for a, a handout, you know, some Cheerios or something. He survived the jaws of our dogs two or three times. Uh, he survived my wife clipping his, finger, his uh, toenails, and it started bleeding. I got a little excited over that, thought he was going to bleed out, but I was just being dramatic. Bird survived. But he just had such an amazing personality. How did God do that? How did he come up with that, this tiny little creature? Sometimes uh, we have hummingbirds on our back patio. And, and uh, I remember one day I was sitting back there with my iPad and I just started filming. And, and just to see them come and circle and hover, where did that come from? Where did that come from? Uh, why did God make dolphins chirp? Dolphins chirp. <laughs> uh, why did God make people to talk? Some of us feel like he should have made us talk less and be quiet more. Uh, why, how, did he, how did he come up with the whole thing of eagles soaring? Or why did he make a stream of water so exquisitely polyphonous? I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but, but a stream of water, and we had some videos of the water as Midian was playing, that beautiful music. The sound of water going over rocks creates every, just about every note in the register and a lot that aren't in the register. And so all together, it's just this, this beautiful healing sound. I, I love it myself. I love it. Um, God created mountains so imposing or poppies so orange or trees so comforting or clouds. I'm so enamored with clouds these days. I think I have more pictures on my iPhone of clouds than anything else. Uh, because I love the way that the light hits the vapors and the clouds and the way that it reflects and it picks up different colors. And to me, all these cloud pictures, every one of them is unique. You would probably look at my phone like my wife would look at it and say, why do you have so many cloud pictures on your phone? Get rid of those things. Why did God make little kids so happy, laughing so much? I learned uh, some time ago that five-year-olds laugh an average of 400 times a day, while adults laugh about 15 times a day. And I know plenty, including myself, who many days don't laugh that many at all. Somewhere between the age of five and 35, uh, we lose about 385 laughs, right? And, and he gave, God gave them such energy. And when I look at creation, I can't help but be amazed. I cannot understand how or why God designed things the way he did. I can see how it works many times, but where did he come up with that? And I can't imagine anybody looking at something even as simple as a little bird or a waterfall or a tree and thinking that just happened. It just, just kind of spontaneously generated that way. When you understand the complexity behind it, there's got to be this, this incredible designer behind all of that. I don't understand how I came up with it, though. And I cannot understand, as it says, God's decisions and ways are unfathomable. I cannot understand the path in which he leads me. Or how he so often redirects me. Back in the old days, uh, the old days, you know, early 2000s, when we, when we had those uh, Garmin GPS things on our dashboards, and you, you go down a, a, a road and you take a turn that was wrong, and the thing would say, recalculating. I don't know if anybody had one of those, recalculating. It's like God has this, this, ability to do that in our lives. It doesn't matter which path we take. He just recalculates, recalculates so that he can still intervene in our lives. He can still guide us to where he needs us to go. 
He recalculates and redirects me when I choose my own way instead of his. And I remember a quote from The Desire of Ages I learned years ago when I sold books door to door as a college student. A uh, college student. It's, when I, it's how I learned to read upside down. You know, call porters, they have to show the book, so you have to read upside down. And, and this was from Desire of Ages, and it says, among other things, God has a thousand ways to provide for us that we know nothing about. That's the Benson paraphrase. I don't understand the difference between what he causes and what he allows. And we have Sabbath school classes and discussions and animated disagreements over, <clears throat> over this very issue. <clears throat> we try to explain and find meaning in events like the loss of our loved ones. But often all we can do is just shake our heads and ask, why, Lord, why? It's a question that we're not the first ones to ask. Throughout the Bible, we find prophets and priests and people asking God, why? Why? I don't understand. And I can imagine that God answers has an answer for that to us. Of course you don't understand. Of course you don't understand. If you understood, then you would be God. But you're not. You're the creature, the created. I am the creator. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are my thoughts high above yours. That's what Isaiah says. We often say, uh, well, in heaven, we'll know why. It'll be clear by and by, right? And, and I agree, maybe we'll get more insight and our understanding will grow in heaven, but the ways of the Almighty are unfathomable. And for the ancient mind that wrote these words, when they, they use that word that talks about the deep, they're thinking of the ocean. To them, it was limitless. There was no bottom to the ocean. That means God's ways are deeper than the deepest ocean. We can't get to the bottom of it because there is no bottom. God's ways are so immense that we'll spend eternity trying to figure out his ways. And when a million years have gone by, we won't even be out of the first grade in understanding God's ways. Third, God's thoughts. God's thoughts. are unknowable. God's thoughts are unknowable. We cannot know his thoughts. Romans 11, 34 and 35 says, who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? Paul is quoting here from Isaiah 43, 10, and he, he alludes to a, a, a passage in Job as well. It says, who, who could know God's mind? Who has, who has ever given anything to God that obligates God to them? And he says this to help us learn, like Job had to learn, that ultimately God is above and beyond human knowledge or understanding. Do you ever think about the story of Job and all the stuff that happened? Remember in the beginning of Job, it tells us, that there's this conversation between the devil, between Satan and and God, and he says, you know, let me let me test Job, and God says, you can't kill him, you can test him, and it goes back and forth, and all this is going on behind the scenes. But at the end of the book of Job, God never tells Job about what was going on behind the scenes. Very interesting, isn't it? To Job, it was unknowable. It was unknowable, and I think. Sometimes this is where we, when we talk about God's thoughts and God's ideas, we can get into trouble if we're not careful. Preachers can tread on thin ice. And we as Adventists can get into trouble because we think we know. We discover some truth or truth, and all of a sudden we, we become the experts on God. We speak before we understand and then we turn to God and say, isn't that right, God? We look for God to affirm our, our belief. And Job, the whole book of Job, Job is defending himself. And finally, at the end, God says, you don't know anything, Job. 
you need to be quiet and let me reveal myself. And I'm, I'm not saying that we should not share the truth that we understand, that we should not share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm just saying we need to be careful of how we carry that knowledge within us. We say things like we have the truth. But the Apostle Paul says, uh, particularly in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, we, we see things imperfectly. It's like a puzzling reflection in a mirror. That's how our knowledge is. We have a glimpse of the truth, an inkling of God's thinking, but we cannot begin to know the mind of God. The older I get, the less I'm inclined to be dogmatic about life, about truth, about God. I can say this is what the Bible says. I can say this is what Jesus says, or this is what Paul says, or Isaiah, or Moses. But I cannot reveal the thought process of the Almighty because God's thoughts essentially are unknowable. There's an interesting verse in Hebrews 8 that I love. It says, the day is coming, I'm, I'm just kind of paraphrasing this, the day is coming when God's people will not instruct each other and say, you should know the Lord. You know, that's kind of what we take as our mission, uh, that we are to teach people, you should know the Lord. But it says the day is coming when you won't be doing that. Why? <laughs> because it says, this is part of the covenant promise, he says, because they will all know God. And I think the words in, in the Bible are from the least to the greatest. They will all know God. The reason given is that God dwells within them. He writes His law, His character, His spirit on the pages of their heart. Writing to the church at Corinth, Paul quotes from, from uh, Isaiah 43.10 with a clarification that turns the unknowable thoughts of God into the transforming presence of his thoughts in us through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.16. This is not on the screen. Who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand this, these things because we have the mind of Christ. It's true, we cannot know the mind of God. But we have the mind of Christ. That's a mystery to me as well. Whatever... I cannot, I cannot ever explain dwell, what dwells within me. I don't need to grasp the thinking of God because the Spirit of God dwells in me. And it has a profound and miraculous effect on my own thoughts and on my own motivations. God is not seeking me out to learn what He does not know. He is seeking me out to fill me with that which I do not possess. We understand these things because we have the mind of Christ. You see, it's more than just in intellect. It's more than just knowledge. It's something that happens inside of us. It's a kind of knowing that Jesus talks about in John 17, 3, where he says, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. And the word know there is, is intimate knowledge. It's experiential knowledge. And finally, the conclusion that Paul comes to is this. Everything comes from God. Everything comes from God. This graphic that I chose uh, reminds me of, of some of my plane trips I've taken in recent years. One last year, particularly when I flew up to Seattle. And as the plane climbs up out of the, you know, out of the airport and through the clouds and up above, where the sun's shining and you see the sea of clouds above it, you begin to realize this world is so much bigger than my life is. <laughs> There's so much more, not only to this world, but to the universe. And you begin to think, if God created this planet, if God created the human race, if God created all the planets in our solar system and, and the Milky Way and the universe that we know according to scientists, is ever expanding. We're ever discovering. What kind of a God do we worship? What kind of a God has, has taken 
taken the time, if you want to say that, that, that is willing to engage us, to redeem us, to save us, to help us in every way. He's poured out all the riches of the universe so that we could be connected with him, so that we could have life. This is what Paul says in Romans 11. Everything, everything comes from him. Everything happens through him. Everything ends up in him. Always glory, always praise. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Amen, I guess that's what it says. But uh, in the vernacular of our day, it's like, yes! Some of you know the uh, great pastor and teacher, Charles Swindoll. He was one of the great pastors in uh, the latter half of the 20th century and on into the 21st century. And this is something he wrote about this passage. Everything. Think of it. That includes your current situation. Think of it. If everything comes from God, if he, if there's nothing that misses his view, if there's no place you can go to escape from God, as Psalm 139 tells us, I can go to the deepest part of the ocean. I can go, go to the highest place I could possibly go, and God is still there. If he's everywhere, if he is in everything, think of it. That includes what you cannot figure out. That includes your loss of employment. That includes your promotion, the blessing of your family. That includes the loss of your precious loved ones. That includes the bewildering test that you are enduring right now. That includes whatever situation you happen to be in right now, regardless of how painful or pleasant it might be. God, everything comes from God, all things. God does not conceal himself nor does he hide his will. The reason why we say it's unknowable and it's unbelievable is because God's so much bigger than we are. It's not because he's trying to hide things from us at all. If we do not see, it is because we are looking for something he is not. If we do not understand, it is because we have expectation, expectations he chooses not to fulfill, but those limitations are ours, not his. Like you, I have a list of questions I would like to ask the Lord when I get to heaven. But then, like Job and Paul, I suspect it won't mean very much when I see him, and I look forward to that day. I hope you do too, and it will all make sense. We won't have to know in our heads. We will know in our hearts. So he goes on and says, Why worry over my list of unanswerable questions? Why not worship him here and now on this side of eternity and let his unsearchable mercy, his unfathom, unfathomable wisdom, and his unmatched character be enough? Is this not a reasonable sacrifice, considering that he is God and I am not? I talked to Midian before the service and asked him if he knew this hymn and he does of course and you all know it too we don't have words for it but I know you can sing it so I'm going to ask uh, kind of as a, a latter part here of our message if you could just join us and uh, I don't know if Michelle is up to it or not but she can come up and help my singing voice is not that great today uh, but uh, you know the song how great they are right how great thou art, I consider to be a doxology. It's all about God, how great God is. And uh, i just like for us to sing it together.
let you stand up, you'll sing better. Michelle, <laughs> you can be seated. Now that's a doxology, right? <laughs> Everything. I suppose there's probably a part of earthly life that does not come from God. And that is the, the core of wickedness that exists in this world and that has poisoned and ruined our race and our planet. But don't, don't misunderstand even Satan is not independent of God. Whatever freedom he might have thought he had is gone. He terrorizes human beings because he's like a fatally wounded beast wreaking vengeance on what God loves. But nothing, nothing exists that is not under God's eye or hand. If, if, if it were true, as so many people in our culture and so many teachers in our culture suggest, that the only thing that we have in this life is the brief life that we have. There's nothing beyond it. If all we can hope for is to be born, to live, and to die, whether it's in comfort or in misery, then we could question the meaning of everything and maybe come to the same conclusions that so many in our day believe in, that there's no purpose to any of this. We can choose to shut our eyes. We can choose to stop our ears. We can choose to close our hearts and to live as if we are alone. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. We are not alone. God is with us. He revealed himself. Everything that we need to know about God, he revealed most perfectly and beautifully through Jesus Christ. And everything comes from Him. Everything happens through Him. Everything ends up in Him, as Paul says. In the beginning, God. Throughout history, God. And if I choose to see Him and know Him and embrace Him, then there is no end with God. Only life, only glory, only praise. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being so patient with us. We get so wrapped up in our lives on this earth and we see the darkness and we feel the pain and we forget how big you are and how good you are and how much you love us. Higher than the highest heaven, that's how, how much higher your thoughts are towards us. We can't conceive why you would love us, why you would give such amazing grace to us, but you did and you have and you are. And so, Lord, I just pray that you will open our eyes to see the reality around us, to see in nature around us, to see in the eyes of our loved ones, in the eyes even of our enemies, the, the, the precious value you have in people, the potential that they have as they turn to you. Instill in us, Lord, a love like you have, a love that is not self-interested, but is focused on the other, a godly agape love, not only for our own community and our fellow believers and our close families, but for our neighbors and for those who are lost in this world. Please, God, instill that in us and and help us to realize every step of the way, every part of our journey with you, every, every bit of the, the ministry and the mission that we have in, in our church, Lord, you're with us at every step. And you just want us to come to you and ask for help and ask for wisdom, ask for guidance. 
Most of all, Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We find in him such hope, such promise, such healing, such love. Bind us together, Lord, with you and with each other through that love, we pray in his name. Now may God bless each one here. Keep our hearts, Lord, open to each other and open to you. Keep us through this coming week. Thank you so much for bringing us here and for going with us as we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.